Daryl, thank you for joining us. Good to see you again, man. No worries. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, obviously, because of COVID, we can't do this face to face. Um, I have met you once before, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've done, we've done work before. How are you dealing with um, with the lockdown? I'm not really affected by the lockdown because I've seen as a key worker, so I'm, I'm more sort of busy than ever. Having said that, you've been in lockdown more than most people for your life, haven't you? <laughs> you had to get that one in, didn't you? <laughs> hey, baby. Um, yeah, I've done a bit of lockdown. I mean, 17 years, maybe? How, how many? I got sentenced to 17 years, 10 months in total. I've done over 12 years in 19 different prisons. But this lockdown out here, it's not really a lockdown, is it? Because you still have access to women, you still have access to finances, you still have access to family, access to decent food and drink. Do you know you have a TV, video, DVDs, Sky? So, I mean, that's that. I mean, we, we don't know the full story about what's happening in most of the Majesty prisons right now, but we know that most people will be in virtually permanent lockdown for a very long period of time, and that takes a toll on someone, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it does. It will, it will have an effect on them. But when I was in jail back in the day, I was on 24 hours a day lockdown. Not 23 hours, 24 hours. They wouldn't let me out of a cell. At one point, I had to live in the seg for six months because the cell was too violent to go in the wings after a few altercations with rivals. But that, that is the thing about prison, isn't it? Um, the, I mean, I think they're getting wiser to it now, but, you know, uh, prison officers and governors are not necessarily going to know your full history and who you have beef with and who you do not have issues with, right? So they could put you on the same wing as a as an opposition, as someone as an opponent. Yeah, definitely they will, will they will do that even if they know that you've got beef with certain people, they will do that just to stir up some trouble. You know, they might not like you, they might not like them and they want it to go off. And it does, doesn't it? I mean I you know I've seen that happen in in, in Belmarsh um, uh, last year. You know that there is a, a, a is a sort of game of chess in terms of where people are placed on what wings and a, a, to what level of dislike there is between certain individuals or certain groups. Yeah, and it's it's you, you've seen it for yourself, like you said in Belmarsh. That happens all across the country. Do you know you know that prison isn't there to rehabilitate people? Prison's there to it's a cash machine, isn't it? Because crime is a business. Is that how you still feel about it? Is that how, you know, let, let's talk about Paint to Purpose early on. That's your mission now, isn't it? After after many years of being involved in crime, um, being shot over 20 times, being stabbed numerous times, also being accused of committing violent crimes, very violent crimes. Um, you now, you've now got a different purpose in life, right? Just explain that to me, Darren. Yeah, I've got an organisation called Pain to Purpose. It's a, a community interest company, non, non-profit. It's all about trying to educate youngsters where I've been and where I don't want them to go. I want them to be the purpose, you know, and not go through the pain because I've suffered a whole heap of trauma throughout my life from a kid right up until adulthood. They say prevention is better than cure, but I don't believe in that saying. So I say prevention is better than court. Because if you get in trouble, you're going to end up in a court. If you get murdered, you're going to end up in a coroner's court. If you commit a murder, you're going to go to jail for life. Do you know, so prevention is better than cure. It's not a saying because if my son was killed, I'd never be cured. So my saying is prevention is better than court. The pain to purpose there is there to help those who need a little bit of guidance and support. So do these people call on you? How does it happen? Yeah, all they have to do is get in touch with me through the website or through providers. Uh, I'm pretty well established now after being in this. Uh, this is my 10th year now. Going into my 11th year of doing this, do you know, I've got a pretty good reputation for what I do. Do you know, because I do what I say I'm going to do. And for many, many years, I was unfunded. Um, 90, about 87% of my work over the 10 years has been for free. Do you know, and uh, it's never been about money with me. That's why, you know, everything happens for a reason. Things start opening up sooner or later. Just give us an example of, of, of some of the kids that you're talking to, what age group they are. 
I see kids from like seven years old right up to adults in jail prisons, you know, in adult prisons. I work with everybody. There's no limit where you can work because everyone needs a little bit of support now and then. You know, a lot of people will admit to needing support. A lot of people put on that act because you know yourself, when I was in a gang, when I was doing what I do, it wasn't me. It was an all the act. We act every day of our lives. You know, none of us are bad. There's no such thing as a bad person. We do bad actions from time to time because, you know, when we do a bad action, it's always brought up. When we do a good action, which is 98% of the time, do we, anyone ever remember that? So when, when you're talking to, say, seven-year-olds, they probably have some idea of, of what your reputation is. Do you go into detail of, of just how young you were when you started? No, I don't, I don't go too much into details with the younger ones. It's when they're like in teenage years that I have to go in and be brutally honest. You know, I have to kind of like powder it down with the kids, you know, because some of them are carrying knives at seven, eight, nine. And in some cases, seven and eight-year-olds are used to carry guns. If they're not going to use them, they're carrying them for our older gang members who aren't that much older, right? Yeah, it was it was alleged that I used to use an eleven year old to carry guns for me back in the day. Greater Manchester police alleged that, and a, a policeman called Andy Hillwood wrote it in a book called Gun Law. Do you know? There's an issue for us, just quite simply, that I'd like to know what your views are on it. Look, knife crime we know has skyrocketed in recent years, but so is gun crime is on the increase, and there are more guns available, more guns being. Um, taken by the police but they're just more guns on the streets and more and, and more guns being used and whereas it used to be a lot of dx and dodgy ammunition it seems to me now that weapons being used are military or you know effectively weapons that were made to kill not weapons that have been decommissioned then recommissioned it, w weapons big business isn't it everybody is on the streets want, wants a weapon everyone needs a weapon you know, so people can charge what they want. And there will be people from the military selling things. I'm not going to lie. It does happen. You know, but guns are guns. guns. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. And a lot of people go to, when they're going out and shooting people with these guns, they're not going to kill them. They're shooting people in the leg thinking they're not going to kill them. But you can get shot. You can die from a shot in the leg. People are leaving people to retaliate. So it's just tit for tat, tit for tat all the time. And it's often over very little, isn't it? Yeah, people argue over standing on someone's shoes in a club, argue over girls, argue over anything. Do you, do you part of your message, um, paint a purpose, do you just go into the tri sometimes just the triviality that has caused you to suffer immense pain through your life? Yeah, I, I go through all of it. I tell them about my mental pain. I tell them about things that have happened to me, my family. I, I go through from the beginning when I was born and um, the circumstances which I was born. I, I'm honest with them about everything. I just ask them not to reveal things on social media because I don't want none of my family members hurt by what did actually happen and what did go wrong. But it wasn't, I mean, let's be fair, I mean, read your notes, you know, it, it was a pretty toxic environment growing up. I mean, you, you, your mum and your dad did not get on when you were younger, right? Or your dad particularly didn't get on with your mum, right? No, not at all. My dad used to be the nicest man ever when he didn't have a drink. But when he was drunk, he used to be a horrible, horrible, horrible bastard. And I'm sorry for saying that words because the stuff I found out since my dad died and my mum's died, I found some stuff my mum had wrote when she was dying because I cared for my mum when she was dying. And it, I was disgusted with it. And if I would have known that at the time, I wouldn't have fucking, I wouldn't have attended no burial or anything like that. I mean, your mum eventually put a stop to it, didn't she? Yeah, my mum stabbed him. And after that, he never, he never raised his hand again. Mum stabbed him three times. But, but being expired, how old were you when that happened? I think it was about nine, ten. Do you remember it clearly? I don't remember it clearly. I just remember the blood. There was just blood everywhere. 
she stabbed him in his shoulder, his arm and his chest. Tell us about growing up on that park. Oh, you know what? It, my side, is a, it's an amazing community. It's just people like me that fucked it up for a few years. <laughs> I'm not sure that's totally true. I'll, I, I have actually went out with a girl from my side for a long, long time ago, back in the 80s, and I went up there. And I found it to be an amazing community, and I was very much welcomed there, and I loved some of the pubs that I went to there. I had a fantastic time. But, yeah, but it always had a reputation that, you know, you had to be careful when you were, you were moving around there. Yeah, because everyone used to stick together, and then the outsiders come in. It was, um, it was quickly seen off because everyone was one. But then, you know, different factions rose above and thought they was bigger and badder than everybody else. And like I said, there's nobody bad. We're all, we're all born human. We all die human. We all die alone. We're all born alone. We're talking of that. I mean, you know, you're very clear. You are very lucky to be alive. But you've known 30 people in your lifespan that have died prematurely due, due to, to, to violence. I've lost over 30 f family and friends through murder. I know over 60 people that have been murdered. Most people don't know 60 people that have died through natural causes. No. To what end? Why? Why? There's no... There's no, there's no reasonable excuse or no excuse why anybody kills anybody. Do you know? Ego, showing off, big-headed, being bullies, being cowards, being shithouses. Do you know? Because that's the only people that shoot people. Back in the day, people used to have a fisticuffs and then forget it. But you know these people going around killing people? I've done it myself. I've cried to myself... I cried myself to sleep in jail, do you know, because we go and do these things, but we don't think of our loved ones. And when we go to jail, it's not our boys that look after us. It's not our mates that look after us. It's our family. It's like I tell, to tell the kids that are carrying knives and getting involved in shit on the streets. When you're in that bed and the doctors are working on you, bringing you back to life, it's your mum that you're crying for. It's not your mates that you're carrying that knife for or you're backing up. It's your mum that you're crying for. So you need to respect life because you only get one chance. I've always believed that you get you get one life. And if I was ever going to have a tattoo, that's what it would say. It would say you get one life and you've got to try and enjoy it. But when you're really young, you know, you have no understanding of that and you have no understanding of the repercussion of your actions. Because I didn't. I mean, I didn't go and grow up in the same environment that you grew up, but... I did still did stupid things because when you're young, you don't understand that, do you? No, you don't understand. It's only when something serious happens when you really think to yourself, wow, that really is real. Do you know, but some people think they're too embroiled in stuff to get out, but nobody's too embroiled. Anybody can escape that life. Do you know, but prevention is better than caught, like I says. One of the things that I noted that sort of happened a lot in my visit to um, to Belmarsh over those four months, was there a lot of lads there doing joint venture? They don't, they, you know, they're, they're part of a group that end up, say, killing someone and nobody, and these are very young lads as well, um, nobody actually puts their hand up to committing the crime that caused the death. So they all get a life sentence. And when I, I was told this, it was all about a loyalty, some people say to me, it's not about that. It's just that if they did grasp, they'd be in serious trouble. Yeah, you know, you know what it is with this joint enterprise? It's one of them funny laws where a lot of people go into jail. And do you think it's right to go to jail for a murder when they're with somebody and they haven't committed a crime? Just, they're just present. But I do a lot of work in joint enterprise in schools. And I, I turn it on its head. I asked them straight, because I'm not judge, jury, or convicted. Do you know, I'm not here to judge anybody or anything. But I ask kids, and I ask kids, do you believe, I play a video, and I say, do you believe that's right? And they say, no, no, no. And when I say to them, so if your mum was stabbed, or your dad, or your brothers and sisters, would you want one person convicted, or all five of them? They soon change their mind. You know, it's not for me to tell them what 
and what, but I know the law, so I know what's going to happen. So, as again, I say prevention is better than caught. Do you know? You, you know, when you go out with your mates, you know if your mate's got something on him. Anyone that tells me that they don't know their mate was carrying something is full of shit. Because when I was active, I was usually the man that was the one that was live most of the time. So, do you know? And everybody knew who was, who had what. Do you know what I mean? Because certain man would go out with you if you didn't have something with you. Because, you know, I was one of them people, a lot of the times I did carry a thing and I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to glamorize it. But I've survived all what I've survived because of a reason and I'm here to make a difference now. Do you know, but there's no reasonable excuse for anybody to be carrying anything. If anybody's got a beef with anybody, got trouble with anybody, they can sit down and talk. Is it is it that simple though, Daryl? Can people talk? Yeah, people people can talk. You know what it is? People don't want to talk. People want to give it the big and you know, I'm this guy, I'm that guy. But when it goes to jail, it's working for 50 pence a day, two pounds a day. You know, it won't work out here for minimum wage, but when it goes to jail, it's in a workshop, slaving away, making sofas for big firms out here. Not me. You won't ever get anybody to tell you that you see me in a workshop. Let's talk about the amount of times that you, I mean, people would be of interest that someone could survive that many rounds. Uh, over 20 rounds on three different occasions, right? Yeah, I got, I got shot once in a 90... Two, then I got shot 20 odd times in 90s, beginning of 96, I believe. And then I got shot once in 97. But when I got shot the 20 odd times, I was with a girl, we were walking back to my house. I was on an estate, um, and I thought that I was invincible, to be honest. My mate come to the pub and says, Get in the car. I was a bit drunk, saying, I'm going to take you home. And I was saying, no, I'm all right. There's nothing or nobody can do anything to me. And then little did I know, some people that I used to associate with was waiting for me because one of one of my so-called mates had phoned them and told them where I was. And they had Mac 10 machine gun, didn't they? Yeah, Mac 10 machine gun, 45 shotgun. So I have shotgun pellets in my chest. Um, I was at the hospital a few months ago because I was having some problems with my chest. Um, a new doctor come to me and she was dead embarrassed. She didn't want to say anything. She, we noticed some things in your in your X-rays. I went, "Oh yeah, shotgun pellets." And she went, oh, "I didn't want to say that." <laughs> but were you were you not wearing a you were wearing a vest, weren't you? Yeah, but some of them went underneath the arm. I got in the back, underneath the back, the chest, through the back, um, shoulder. Both arms, head, ass, under under the vest, just under the back, just under below where. So, so to just to so say you're walking down the road with a girl and you see these guys in front of you, you turn. No, I walked up to them, put my arms out like that. Said, so "What? What the fuck?" And then I thought that I didn't, I didn't think he was brave enough to be honest. One of them was my cousin. No. Yeah, but I'm not going to go into it because... No, no, no. Yeah, one of them was my cousin. So, shotgun and a Mac-10. Yeah, and guns. There was loads of them. There was five of them. Did they leave you for dead? What happened then? Yeah, they left me on the floor. But none of, none of them didn't come up and finish it, did they? Well, clearly not. And obviously it happened for a reason and it was happened. I use it as my tool to educate others because not many people will be as lucky as me. Certainly not, mate. There are so many people that can get nicked with a knife that long and if it's in the wrong place, they're gone. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I do a lot of work on knife crime, obviously, because knife crime has gone through the roof now. And you know one thing about a knife it's never going to lose its point. Whereas a gun will break down at some point. A knife capable of killing millions of people. Yeah, a knife's got as many rounds as it wants. Exactly. 
you gave a very, very good description of what it feels like to be shot, and you should know. You said it's like being hit by hot hammers. Yeah, definitely, especially when it hits you in your bones. There's no women think pregnancy is bad and giving birth. Do you know that's how I can compare it to? Because I don't know nothing else like it. Um, I had sciatica a couple of years ago. That's pretty bad, but I don't know anything worse than getting shot. Do you know you're getting stabbed hurts, but it's nowhere near as painful as getting shot. It's interesting. You know, you get shot twenty times and you manage to get yourself out of hospital relatively quickly. You get shot in the leg once and you're in for nine months. Is that right? What was that? Yeah, that's because I got MRSA in it. It's back then. It was it was one of them things that kill you. Yeah, my, my flesh is getting eaten, and then my doctors refused to give me the antibiotics because it was ninety pound a bottle, and I had to have three bottles a day. So there was a bit of a war between the hospital and the doctors, obviously because everything's on a budget. But we got there in the end. I mean, do you sometimes wake up? look in the mirror and go, I shouldn't be here. Yes, a lot of the times I don't sleep, but yeah, I, I really, I'm truly, I shouldn't be here, so there must be a higher power out there. How about you go, look, we, we also know that the people carrying knives and using them, and occasionally the people using guns and using them are getting younger, right? Yeah. How do you, how do you approach that? Because... It's hard enough dealing with a teenager, but if you're dealing with someone sub 13, who's got, you know, active, is active as a, as a gang member, is, is either selling drugs or making money from the sale of drugs. Difficult to reason with somebody that young, isn't it? It's difficult to tell them, again, you know, the consequences of your actions could cause you and other people immense pain. Yeah, but, you know, if you break it down, how much they're actually making selling these drugs, they're making very, very little because they're smoking most of it. They're smoking most of the profit in weed. Yeah. Do you know? And if you break it down, you work in McDonald's for 20 years or you're on the streets for 20 years, which one are you going to earn the most money? Definitely McDonald's because the amount of losses you're going to get. You might even not survive 20 years if you're on the road. You might go to jail for life, you might get killed. Working in McDonald's, you're going to get a mortgage. You're going to make it to a manager at some point, 40 grand a year. But when you say that, do you think about the wasted years, your own wasted years? You know, I don't because I know that everything's happened for a reason. Do you know, if I didn't do what I do now, I didn't go through this life, I wouldn't be able to educate people. And I've worked with over 200,000 people in 10 years. It's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, it's like anything that's preventative, and I'm, I'm often at, at pains to point this out. The difficulty is to get funding for stuff that is preventative, because it's very difficult for politicians and the like to go, oh, we did this, we did that, please vote for us. So, you know, preventing someone from harming themselves or harming others is a very difficult thing to quantify, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, you know what? Prevention's always going to be cheaper than... Oh, Totally. You know what? We haven't got no money for youth clubs yet. We haven't got no money for youth provision, but we always find money to convict a youth of murder. We always find money to give them a bed. I'm working at a Young Offenders right now uh, for six months, uh, two days a week, and it's about 80 grand a year to keep them there. So if you give a kid a life sentence, a lot of kids think a life sentence is 20 years, 25 years. A life sentence on computers is actually 99 years. Well, you, you obviously get a tariff and you might get out of your tariff, but we can find £6 million for a murder trial, £2 million for a murder trial, whatever. It's about, on average, about £2.2 million per murder trial for one person. If there's five on it, take times that five. We find the money to fund that, but we can't find money to fund youth clubs. Crime is a business. But do you think, do you think, um, Daryl, it's just as simple as youth clubs, or is it more about the opportunities that many, many kids just do not see the opportunities that are out there for them? It's not all about youth clubs, but if we give kids something to get them active, yeah, and get them engaged, getting them mixing with people from other estates, they're less likely to get involved in any problems. Obviously, they need male role models and stuff like that, but. 
youth clubs, it's a start, isn't it? Youth provision. No, I, 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 I agree. I just don't think it, it's just one thing. We have, mil- we have millions to find them a bed in a prison. We'll always find them a bed in a prison, but we'll find them a bed out here. I do think that youth clubs could play a major part in, in causing a lot of people not to necessarily get into trouble with each other. But there's other things as well. I think, do you not think that, that schools can often um, play a part and, 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 and pupil referral units, for me, I mean, I recently made a programme about gun crime and there seems to be like, I'll be careful what I say, but pupil referral units, putting a load of kids who've got issues and problems all together in the same school seems to me like you're magnifying a problem. You're not trying to address it. You're just trying to basically, I don't know, lock it down. And that just, to me, seems to be a preliminary before you go to, you, you know, youth offending and then you go on to prison. You know, it's like, we're going to throw you all together. And you could actually, I went outside one and I could see guys, OGs turning up in BMWs and picking these kids up. They weren't their dads. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we, 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 you know what? We, we all understand that schools could be doing a lot more because a lot of schools don't take the time to help people. They're quick to throw them in a pupil referral unit, obviously because of stats. Because they're dragging, because they're, exactly, because they're dragging that class down. It makes their whole school look bad. So rather than addressing that individual, we slide him along the system. Yeah, and a lot of these, a lot of these individuals, they are suffering from early adverse trauma. So they need to be, they need to be worked with on a one-to-one basis, but people don't seem to want to fund that or want to help them. They just think more about the stats and a kid that might be lost, a kid that might be in trouble, they might have been abused, they might, anything could have happened to that poor kid. Do you know, they're quick to throw them in pupil referral units and I wouldn't say pupil referral units are the best place, but I wouldn't say they're the worst place because I do a lot of work with certain pupil referral units and there is some good ones, there's some really, really bad ones I, I totally agree, and I don't. I don't think that I, I, I would. I wouldn't address that to all PRUs. I would just say that uh, there are some there. That's the ones that I saw there. That it, you could see what was happening outside the school gates, right? So, but I, I would agree with you as well. There are some really good ones out there as well. So education plays a part. I think, as you say, I do think there's not enough money invest, invested in in prevention. What about the relationship between certain communities and the police? Is that where is that where do you see that at the moment in Greater Manchester? Uh, I don't I don't really I kind of like have no opinion on that. Do you know it's uh, it's one of them things. Not everybody's going to get along. Do you know? Obviously. But do you think enough efforts being made? Is there any effort being made? People are trying to make effort, but it's not working. It's it's very easy to say and very hard to do, isn't it? Yeah, everything's easy to say. Everything's easier said than done, isn't it? You know, a lot of people talk the talk, but will walk the walk. You know, one person, one people blame the police, one people blame the community, and they're both as bad as each other. You know, until they sit around the table and get their differences out on the table and say where you're going wrong and where you're going wrong, it's never going to change. They can have all these community meetings with the police and all that, all they want, but it's just the same thing time and time again. Um, Also, one of the things that I was looking at earlier, you know, the price of drugs has gone up on the street because of lockdown, because it's been harder to get to get them in. Have you? Do you know anything about that? Would you talk about that? Nah, I stay away from the streets. (laughs) I stay away from the streets. Obviously, obviously, I hear. A year like you, Ed, you know. In the day, that's how you kicked off, wasn't it? You basically you did it. You got some cigarettes, you sold them. One of your relatives said, "Oh, give me that money, and we can get some heroin, and we can save a lot more money." And he did you, and then you went. Actually, I can make some money out of this. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I thought I could make some money out of it, but I didn't think, believe, or think the misery that comes with it, and the years of hell that I went through would happen. Do you know, I thought I'd make a bit of money. That's that's it. I didn't think, ever dream of living this life. But I'm just thankful to be alive. Do you do you still have any uh, connections with people from from back in the day? Do you? I have no connections with people from 
back in the day. The only people I really connect with back in the day is um, one of my old adversaries, one of my old really enemies. Yeah, we speak quite often. We used to do a bit of work together. And maybe in the coming year, we'll get back in the schools together. And is that is that difficult for you? Obviously not. You, you've obviously come to an understanding, yeah? It's not difficult. We go around the schools and show people that no matter what can happen, we can get over things. He's lost mates, I've lost mates, but there's no winners in war. I might kill 10 of your mates, you might kill one of my mates. We're both lo lost. There's no winners in war. Do you know, if you sit around a table, you can sort things out, you can come to agreements, come to arrangements, but there's no winners in war. But the only thing glamorous that's going to come out of a gang is when your mum gives you the funeral that you deserve. Because your mates ain't going to give you the funeral. Your mates will buy a T-shirt saying, rest in peace, Daryl, when that fades, it gets thrown away. Do you know, it's your mum or your dad that suffer for years and years. And you know yourself, the price of a funeral. And where we come from, these kind of places, people get themselves in debt to bury the kids. And them kids ain't respecting their mums who went through L, bringing them into the world, brought them up, and now they want to go on road. It's no, it's no good. I, I once spoke to five mums, and it was, uh, it was, it wasn't even doing a program, I was doing something else. I, I was asked to go to a community and speak, and uh, it was in North London, and they were, you know, there was white mums, black mums, mixed race mums there, but all of them had one thing in common, their sons were dead, right? And they used to say, I used to, you know, that my boy would come home and, and I'd go down the police station and say they got stopped on the sus again, stopped and searched, stopped and searched, stop hassling my boy. And then one of the mothers just turned around to me and she said, you could stop my son every day if I could have him back again, you know? And I think it is, it's the mums, it really is the mums that suffer, suffer so, so dreadfully. And as you say, um, in, the upper, in the times that I've seen people, you know, that wail that you hear at a funeral when they see their child in a coffin, that is something that I personally can never forget. And I, you know, I wasn't even, I didn't even know that boy, but you hear that wail, that wail stays in your head because that is the mum. A mum should never bury a son. I know, we're, we're, we're brought up to bury our parents, you know, but where we come from, there's some of the stuff that we're getting involved in. It's our mums burying us. It's wrong. Do you know? We don't respect our mums enough to value our life because they risk their life by bringing us into this world. So how do you stop it? How do we stop? We need to education, 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 engagement, education, empower them, show them that they can achieve something. Do you know? I never thought I could achieve anything. I'm not going to lie. I used to use that excuse. Uh, I can't get a job. I can't do this and all that, but over the last 10 years, I've used life experience to get me in some of the best places ever. Do you know, I've advised Prince Charles on knife crime. Do you know, I've been to the palace, sat down with him and Tom Hardy. Do you know? And I've done it the hard way. Kids can do If you believe you can achieve, kids can do this, do you know, if they have some belief in themselves. Someone put their arm around the shoulder and told them that you, your life matters, you know, because every life matters. Do you think the role model thing is an issue as well, that there aren't enough strong role models for some of these kids? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely not enough strong role models. And a lot, of the, a lot of the role models don't want to be seen, do you know? They want to be seen in the wrong places, do you know, where really and truly everybody should be come together. And a lot of people have got egos, so people won't work alongside people. So we need more role models because, you know what, the, the news make it out like it's a black thing. It's not a colour thing. You know, it's not a colour thing whatsoever. Knife crime, gang crime, guns, youth violence, it doesn't discriminate whether you're white, black, Asian, gay, trans, bi. You can all be affected. No, I agree. 100% I agree. I just don't see, you know, obviously the world's in a very odd place right now because of, of COVID. But, you know, if this, this virus goes away, hopefully it will. These issues aren't going away, are they? No, the issues ain't going away. 
the issues ain't never going to go away until people can start working together and the issues ain't going to go away. Do you know, you know what we need? We need the guys who from my era and the era above and the era below to go to the young guys and tell them, don't do this road thing. Do you know? But not a lot of people want to come out and get involved. But you know there's blood on my hands because of all them young kids from my area that's got killed and killed people. Because if I would have taught them better, they wouldn't have been doing that. So there's blood on my hands and there's blood on everybody else's hands in my community and them older guys that allow their youngest to go get killed and kill people. You know, you were, I mean, you had a reputation that was such, you were, well, said to be the most dangerous man in the Northwest. You were banned from going back to your your hometown, which earned the reputation Gunchester. Uh, and you say that you are partly responsible for that, yeah? In 2011, I released Mapa 3 Tier 4. Um, the Northwest Police Commission says I was the most dangerous person in the Northwest. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't admit to it, I wouldn't deny it, but it helped me get where I wanted to be because I'm here now. So it gave me something to prove them wrong. Do you know, I was a very violent man in the past, a very bad person at times, but not at all times, because I've always had a good art and I've always helped people out and struggled myself through doing that. But obviously, if I didn't do what I do, the police couldn't have said that, the government couldn't have said that. I wasn't allowed back in Manchester for two and a half years. My mum had a heart attack whilst I was not allowed in Manchester. And we had to make a legal fight to, for me to visit in hospital. And um, I, I was living in Liverpool at the time. I was I was granted permission to go, but I had to meet the police at the train station. They had to drop me at the hospital. They had to wait outside and then drop me back to the train station. I was only allowed one visit. And then sadly in 2013, my mum was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And at that time I was gonna stay in Liverpool, but I was allowed back in Manchester. December 17th, 2013, I just left Liverpool and come back and cared for my mum. And then my mum died 15 months later. But even at the, your mum's wake, there was an issue, wasn't it? Yeah, someone was shot. Um, a friend of mine was shot. Do you know why? You know why, but you can't say. It, it's just unexplainable and... Right, mate. I know. It's, it, just, it just seems to be, you know... As you say, there's not many people who know 60 people who have had their lives cut short. There's not many people, but there's many, there is many people like me, you know, from these areas that know the same people that I know. Do you know it's, and it's, it's too much. It has to stop. It's too much. So if you went to the, the Office of National Statistics, their number at the moment, they admit that gun crime's gone up by 4%, knife crime. Over the far, last five years, it's gone up by 27%. But the big thing for me is they say that there are 27,000 gang members in the UK. And I would say that that is a number that is way below what I possibly think is out there. 27,000. I think, I, I think like you, Ross. I think that's way off the mark, personally. But you know, stats is just a thing. Stats don't mean nothing. Do you know? That's their stats. That's not the real life stats. In terms of paying to purpose, is there any kind of united policy presently that is being implemented to dissuade kids from ending up in games? No, it is. I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. I can only do what I do. I can only be me, you know, I can't speak for anybody else, but nine times out of 10, people are getting funded and not delivering on that funding. You know, they write up a good funding bid and all that, and <coughs> I don't see none of that work getting done. You know, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but if I get such and such funding, I've only been funded since October. I've had three lots of funding and the funding is going to, it's going to make a difference. It is making a difference already because I'm working in a jail under one of lots of the funding. I don't do this work alone. You know, paying to purpose, 
isn't just me. There's people in the background that are supporting me. It's like, obviously, the twins support me, and they never ask me to promote them or anything. They kind of like well, let's promote them because they're they're a fashion. They're they're two they're two twins. They're a fashion. Um, they're fashion designers. They make their own kit, and and you wear it, and uh, and it very stylish it is. And as you said, you couldn't get any um any any kind of local government support. So. Fair play to them for for helping you out, right? Yeah, they definitely. They, they, honestly, and they don't ask for promotion. Don't ask for nothing. They just anything can need. Anything can need them and base security do provide. Do you know? And I don't. And it might be just a talk here, a talk there, empower me to go on. Because obviously, I suffer mental health. Do you know? I'm through the twins. I've I've linked up with Aunt, Aunt Middleton. As you you'll know, and you know, a really, really good guy, really good friend of mine. Do you know? And it's it's all it's about everybody coming together. A lot of people want me to fail. Why? Why? Because it all been passed against me. Bad news sells, isn't it? You never forget and get about the past. <clears throat> but I've also been doing more bad than anybody in my side, Manchester, over the years. But I've also been doing more good than anybody in Manchester, not my side. The whole of Manchester. Do you do you still have to look over your shoulder? I don't look over my shoulder. I don't look over my shoulder one bit. The only way I look over my shoulder is to see how far I've come. Do you know? Because I know what I'm doing, and I know that someone up there is protecting me. Um, just to anyone that might be listening to this, that's either a you know in a gang thinking about joining one or is on the periphery of joining one, what would you say to them? There's no loyalty in gangs. The only loyalty you're ever going to get is from your mum, your dad, your brothers and sisters. There's nothing positive about being a gang. There's no reasonable excuse for anybody to join a gang. There's no life in gangs. Gangs, if you work out what gangs, gang, the word gang means, gangs are not good. Do you know there's nothing good and you will go to jail and you will cry like a girl, like a baby when you're missing your mum. You're not going to cry for your mates. You're going to cry for your mum, the one who suffers and struggles to send you postal orders because your mates ain't going to do that. Your mates are going to want you back when you're about to get out, you know, so they can use you again. But a lot of people carry a knife for the mates to back up the mates and your mates ain't going to do a life sentence for you. Your mates ain't going to kill nobody for you and they ain't going to die for you. They might do a life sentence for themselves. They might die for themselves. They're not going to die for you, so don't be willing to die for them. Anything can be done. Do you know? You can exit gangs. If any of you having problems throughout the country or anything, I'm not nobody big. I'm not nobody special, but I know people all over the country, and I might know somebody that you might know or you might fear, and I might be able to speak to mediate things for you for you to exit that position that you're in you know you will you need to be willing to live for your family and you need to reach your potential and make yourself proud and make your family proud that that advice i think um coming from you is pretty sound daryl thank you very very much thanks a lot <laughs>